Welcome back to the Women of Courage Online Bible Study. We are in our final week, week four of the Imperfect Hospitality Reading Plan. And today I'm talking with Krista Wells about what it means to simply open our hearts and homes to other people. We're talking about this common struggle that we often experience with disclaimers and apologies when it comes to inviting people into our homes and how really that detracts from the real objective of connecting deeply with one another. Krista offers great insight. I was so encouraged by our conversation. I know you will be too. Come join us. Krista, in your devotion, you talk about this difference that you have seen in a few of your friends when visiting their homes. What made their response, or maybe lack thereof, stand out to you? Um, it was just such a contrast to what I've experienced more often in middle class, upper middle class circles, uh, of which I've been a part. Um, these families, and I can think some here in Nashville, some overseas in Costa Rica, a mm -hmm. particular family back in Raleigh. Um, when you enter their home, there's no disclaimers, there are no apologies. It's you really feel like the minute you walk in all they see is you mm. and um and that it just feels so good and so so refreshing to feel like this um this gathering is really just about the people who are here it's mm -hmm. about connecting and uh, it just it puts me as a guest at ease i feel yeah. I'm not feeling their self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. I have to t take care or of their emotions in that moment and say, oh, no, it's really beautiful. It's fine, you know. Right. And, uh, I think also I instantly feel permission to have them come in my house. Mm -hmm. you know, with a real mess and to yeah. be a real self. Yeah, because you talk about how, and it stood out to you as a contrast because often when you go to someone's home or you recognize that you, that you do it yourself, we kind of have this default of immediately when someone walks through the door, we want to apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry that the fixtures are outdated. Oh, ignore the kitchen, it's a mess. Oh, I'm so sorry, like I didn't have a chance to clean up. Like we just get into this apologizing mode, but I love what you said, like when that was absent, you just felt seen. It wasn't about the environment, it was about this opportunity for connection. Right, and it's not about, it, it feels like it's not about the host at that moment, that the host mm -hmm. is just really present. And, um, you know, I remember this time, you know, you can only maintain that facade anyways for so long. If you're a person right. who opens home regularly, uh -huh. and if you have anybody else sharing your space, kids or animals or even spouse, whatever, roommates. Um, so you can like keep that bar really high a few times, but mm -hmm. not by unexpected, uh, you know, or if you're going to have weekly gatherings, then it's, it's just not possible. And I think when I right. got to where I had <clears throat> five children and a dog and, and a lot of outside work and interactions, that um, a lot of my ability to even pretend to myself that I had it all together just fell away. Mm -hmm. I remember one Easter having uh, a number of friends over after church and <laughs> our pastor's wife said something that, um, I think maybe in a different stage of life, I would have been kind of like made insecure or offended by, but I took mm -hmm. it as such a compliment that day. She's because our back door was made out of glass mm -hmm. and our kids had handprints everywhere. And of course my dog, you know, it was spring, it was muddy and the dog had paw prints and mud. Up, and I just had not had time to do that, you know, care about that as I made food for people. And yeah. she, on it. She's like, I just love coming to your house because it's so refreshing to see the mess and to see these mm -hmm. smudges. And, you know, I think a past self would have been like, oh, you know, oh, you yeah. noticed that? Oh, I did. But what she was saying is it freed her. To right. Take. And so then I started making a joke out of it. I, I would say, I'm here to make you all feel much better about yourselves <laughs> and your lives and your house, which is in and itself another disclaimer. So I need to not do that either. <laughs> right. But it's true. And I, I remember as a young mom, um, you know, three little ones at home feeling like there's no way I can have someone over because like, I can't, 
I can't even brush my hair, like cannot manage other people's expectations or my perceived expectations that they might have. And I remember the same thing, going to a friend's house. And the first time I went there, yes, things looked very polished, very put away. But by the second time, she goes, you know what? If we're going to be real friends, come into my real house. This is how it really looks on a Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. And I was like, yes, there was laundry to be folded. There were, you know, d breakfast dishes in the sink. There were, like, her kids live there. People live there. Let me see you live here. And it just, it freed me to be like, yeah, I don't have to apologize for living in my house. Right. I can still invite people to join me in it. Yes, absolutely. I remember my, um, in our old house, we had a woman who would come and spray for roaches and things. Mm -hmm. And I would, I was so, living such a crazy season. Um, and well, who am I kidding? I'm just always kind of a hectic person. <laughs> I was never prepared, you know, and it was mm -hmm. a big house we used to live in. So, and I was homeschooling, whatever. So she would show up and I would do that. I'd be like, oh, Nancy, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a person who's about to go into my bedroom. Like I can't even close the door. Right. She's closet in the bath she saw it all but she was an older woman and I remember her saying um Krista if I came in here and you're homeschooling five kids and you had an immaculate house I would worry about your children you know she's like you're doing your your priorities would be off if your house mm. was able to be immaculate right now so yeah I tried to remind myself people are more important than things or right I love how in um, in your devotion called an open door you kind of boil the issue down to this question I love the way that you wrote it Krista you said why do we say our identity is in Christ and we are here to love others yet we live like our identity is in our appearances and we are here to impress others why do you think we struggle um, as Christian women with knowing that our identity is in Christ and yet living like it's not? Yeah, I, that is something I've been really trying to get behind the last couple of years to answer that question, why? And not just, not the, the end part of the sentence could be rephrased to be any number of things. Why do we say our identity is in Christ, but we live as if... Mm number of things. It could be my relationship status or mm -hmm. my kids behavior or anything. But um and and so I feel like recently I'm coming to an, a thought on why that might be. Um and it's that I think we skip a very important step in our spiritual development. I think mm -hmm. um, especially if we were raised in the church. Mm -hmm. Raised in the church. Yeah me too. <laughs> Okay, so we're, we're taught a lot of true things. We're taught mm -hmm. about how God sees us and how that is what gives us our inherent value mm -hmm. that he created us in his image. So we, we hear that, but then we kind of skip to, therefore, go out and take care of other people and do loving things for other people. And what gets missed in there is the internalization of the truth. Mm. God loves me. What does that mean? What does that? Mm -hmm. mean? What? How does that change my thinking about myself? Yeah. It is not enough for us to say God loves us if we don't share His mind and we don't agree with Him. Mm. Because when once we get to a place where our internal life is full of abundance and knowing that we are beautiful and loved and worthy um, when we adopt the mind of God about ourselves and mm -hmm. fondly at ourselves and going, I like being me. I love these things that he's given me. Um, then when we go out and, and meet other people's needs, we invite them into our homes and into our lives, we're upgrading from a place of abundance and not operating out of our own neediness. Mm -hmm. We operate out of our neediness without being aware that we are. We think, I'm just a kind person. I just really like doing things for people. Yeah. But behind the scenes, like behind the app, there's this other app running saying, affirm me. Tell me yeah. that, you know, I do want you to be comfortable in my house. So it is loving you to mm -hmm. clean up my house and to prepare good food. But behind that is also, I want you to think of me as the person who makes you comfortable. Yes. I want you to think of me as being the 
person who's so good at preparing this space. But if, if we're not so needy, then we can then let people into our mess and feel completely unthreatened. It wouldn't even really enter our minds so much if it happens to be a mess that day. Right. We're not at all attached to our workers. But I, so I don't know how to answer that in a short way yet. <laughs> no, so but I like how you're unpacking that. Yeah, I just, I think we really, especially as Christian women, we, we jump from God loves me, God loves other people, I will love other people. We don't include, I have to love me because God loves me. Mm. Really internalize and be transformed by the truth. Because a lot of knowledge is useless if it doesn't change you. Right. And I think it's important to note too, Krista, that the type of needy neediness you're talking about, it's not a material neediness because right. the friends that you went in and felt very just welcome to their home on a material level, they probably had more needs and wants than you yes. or me or some of our other friends. Um, but you saw that they knew God loved them and had to really internalize that in a way that regardless of their circumstances, um, they could still receive that love and give that in a genuine way. Am I hearing you right? Yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope that that is what's behind the difference in their behavior. I don't, you know, I think conditioning is also a lot of part of it. Like mm -hmm. if you've been raised in white middle-class culture, you have been conditioned to value certain things and to think that is what sure. you do, that is important. Yeah. Um, but, I, but what is communicated through their action is definitely love you know god's love that's in them and they're able to spread it out to their neighbors and yeah. in, and um i just found that really beautiful and refreshing without putting them on a pedestal like they're angels and have no you know other issues right yeah this is the, this was a takeaway from people who had nothing to impress me with except yeah. love in their yeah. presence and i think part of really understanding God's love for us. And then like, I like how you said, like, I like myself, like I'm, I'm grateful for like what I've been given is then we're able to embrace those gifts and not be in this comparison trap of, well, I don't have what she has. Like I have, um, two dear friends and the three of us are, are close. And, and my one friend is super gifted in what we would think of as traditional hospitality. Like, and it comes out of the overflow. Like she loves, her home is beautiful and she loves cooking organic gourmet things. And you just, you know, you come in and it just is like, like the, the, the place feels very refreshing, but that's like a natural overflow. Whereas my other friend is honestly more of kind of a, a scattered, cluttered kind of personality and home. And so she would feel, I could tell she felt this weight of like, I don't have this beautiful spread. But what that friend does have is she has this amazing ability to listen. She like leans in. She's my first friend who I felt like that's what it looks like to care for someone's heart. Like, and so just to be able to encourage her and be like, you are you and we love you for who you are and what you give. Like, honestly, I don't care that you have like three weeks worth of mail on your counter. Don't care. I didn't come to see a cleared off counter. I came to see you. And I think that also as friends, we can encourage one another in this area by calling out the good and the strengths of how God uniquely wired each of us and be like, yeah, like I may not have like an organized fridge or I may not have yada yada, but that's not who God made me to be. This is who God made me to be. Right. Yes, and to celebrate those differences and even to um, insist on like that friend, I don't know that friend, but I know people like that in my life might be tempted to always say, well, we'll go to your house or we'll go to her. Right. Not because they wouldn't really love to have you in their house, but they assume that you would prefer to be at the bigger, fancier, cleaner house. Right. And I've heard single friends in my life lament the fact that they always go to their married friend's Mm. and the other they never are reciprocated they would and I think so I think if you have a bigger home or you have this gift you can encourage another person by saying I don't care I really want to come to your house this time yeah I want to come to you you stay put and you know we'll, we can pitch in or whatever but yeah we value what you and celebrate who you are and because I think those types of people can often just assume you don't want, wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be there. And so they can 
benefit from that encouragement. Yeah. I love that um, you talk about this in your devotion. At the very end of the book of Acts, we find this great example. It's kind of this like little nugget of what it looks like to simply open our door. Acts 28.30 says, Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who visited him. No disclaimers, right? Just a simple welcome. So, Krista, what encourages you about Paul's model of hospitality? I think just like we've been talking about, it, it, he makes, it makes it so simple. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't look like he planned big events or mm-hmm. made awesome food or anything. He, it's simply about the people. He cared about making people. Not even, it doesn't even say he cared about making them feel anything. It just said he welcomed them. Right. So it probably was <laughs> simple, you know, for me, yeah. they overthink these things a lot of the time. So it's just like, hey, somebody's knocking. Come on in. Let's just yeah. listen to the porch and connect. Um, so it does, it, the fact that that was, you know, the writer took the time to include that in the scripture. Mm-hmm. Tells me that there's something important about it, something to pay attention to. Right. Um, that the act of welcoming others in is, mm-hmm. is um, supposed to be a hallmark of the Christian life. And I think it doesn't always have to be, it's not limited to our physical space. It's also opening our lives and our homes and like your mm-hmm. friend, leaning in and being a, a hospitable heart, you know, yeah. a person that people feel safe with, whether you're in their home or at the coffee shop or whatever is always, right. you're welcome. And I will listen and be with you. Yeah. I will listen and I will be with you. Such a powerful posture. So in your devotion, you mentioned that, um, and you kind of talked about here a little bit, that at one time you lived in a big house on a cul-de-sac, um, and then you moved to a smaller home on a busy street. So what are some practical ways that we can be intentional to open our door regardless of where we live? Because I think wherever we live, there are things that make it easy and things that make it super challenging. So you kind of have these two different experiences. What can you tell us? Yeah, well, um, I when I first moved into the small house, I didn't have people in for a while, um, and I I thought, well, we can't. Mm. We have. And then it, you know we were going through a difficult time, my kids and I, and I just got to the point in the winter where I thought, it we need that normalcy. We need to have people in. It's good mm-hmm. for us, and it's good for our community. Mm-hmm. And so what we did, given a very limited space, I mean, my family couldn't even fit around the kitchen table. The, ta- the one table we had um, that would fit in that space was too, too small for even my whole family. So um, I just started picking, and I'm busy single mom, so mm-hmm. I can't prepare a lot of stuff. So I yeah. chose one night a week that I thought we were all likely to be home without activities. I chose Wednesday nights and when possible, I would send an email out to a small group of people and say, I'm going to make soup on this night. And we called it Warm Wednesdays. And I would make soup and say, you can bring a side or some drinks, whatever. I'm not going to have anything but soup. <laughs> but yeah. And I would just send it out to a few people so mm-hmm. I, it wasn't going to be overwhelming. And um, things like that, I think, can really work if you're dealing with a small space or a small mm-hmm. tight schedule is to pick one night or one day. And you don't have to, like, tell people, Hey, come over every Wednesday. You can just in your mind have that Mm -hmm. open and then be spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wednesday. Is there somebody I want to invite over this Wednesday? Keep the group small. If you're limited to small space or use your outdoor space when it's warm enough or Mm -hmm. meet at the park. Like I've done that. I've gathered friends and said, Hey, everybody just bring a few to the park. Um, Yeah. And I, and I think also not trying to do it all just, Mm-hmm. Say, hey, can you all bring something? We'll just yeah. pitch it. I want to be with you, but I can't make dinner for everybody, you know, or I'll have this. Right. I, I've just been amazed. Um, we did that even when we were in the big house. Um, I had such a limited time uh, availability because of all the kids. And so I practiced it that way, even in the big house. I would ask people mm-hmm. to bring something. Yeah. And I found that people really actually feel more at home when you let them wash some dishes or cut, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, because then you feel like you are entering in and doing a piece of life together. 
Um, I remember when my kids were really little, they're now all in elementary school, but um, I felt overwhelmed by having people in my home. But I, I also valued wanting to invest in deep friendships and also wanting to recognize that my identity is in Christ, not in, not in the way things look. And so for me, like what was, was, what was manageable was I would invite friends over for popsicles in my backyard. Yes. I want to come over from 10 to 11 to have popsicles in my backyard. And I could put on a, a pot of tea or a pot of coffee for the moms, but I, that's it. That's, that's it. it. And they were so happy to come. And then I would even say, hey, if you think you want to stay for lunch, go ahead and pack your lunches and come on over. Because <laughs> I'm in that season, I'm like, I can't even like make myself real food. All I eat is like peanut butter and jelly crusts and like the ends of yogurt cups. Like I can't make a meal for someone else, but I can invite you to come and to do life together. And I think that that's probably what Paul did too. He opened his home said, come on in, I'm doing life here, you're welcome to join me. Well, I think, you know, Paul was probably, um, because of the nature of his life and work, he was interested in the depth, going deep, mm -hmm. not like what's up here. So yeah. the more you're interested in seeing people deeply, the less you even know, or think about the superficial things, because that's where your focus is. Yes. Um, a couple other thoughts that occurred to me were, on a practical level, um, I have a certain minimum in my head of where I, I, what makes me feel at peace in my own space. Mm -hmm. So I pick a couple, there are a couple rooms that like, I really at the end of the day want this to be tidy because when I wake up and feel better. Yeah. And I do that when people are coming over as well. Like the whole place doesn't have to be spotless. I just need this table to be clear. Yes. Yeah. And, empty, and I will close all the other doors. And that's, mm -hmm. um, and another thing that I think is important for us as Christian women is to not to be careful not to hear this, even this conversation as another should, because mm -hmm. um, I think that really just robs us of joy in so many ways in life mm -hmm. and forget that Christ came to set us free, to make mm -hmm. us free. And so the first job is to, um, to adopt his way of thinking about mm -hmm. ourselves and our lives. And then we are free to have people over today or this week or not, you know, to go, this is a season where that's not really actually good for me and my family to have people in our home right now. And that mm -hmm. is okay. But yeah. I can, if I want to, yeah. I am free to open the door today physically or to not open it all the time. I'm going to have an open heart, you know, yeah. but allow yourself the grace to have your life look different in different seasons. Different yeah. Seasons. I love that. Let's be women of courage who open our doors without disclaimers. Let's be women of courage who really believe that our identity is in Christ. He loves us. And because we can love ourselves, we can open the door to loving others. <laughs>